I started Portraits of Liberty in March of 2020. Two years on, I have finally hit my 50th episode. This is quite the occasion, especially considering I thought I would easily run out of ideas by now. But thanks to people's kind comments and feedback, I've always been motivated to seek out more historical figures who advance the cause of liberty. Doing this show has really reinforced my belief that liberty is not a result of any particular culture or race, but a universal urge in human nature, one that defies all empty dogmas. So from the bottom of my heart, thank you, thank you for listening. It really does mean the world to me. For a bit of a celebration and a little bit of a change, I'm going to do something different. Usually I try to steer away from expressing my personal opinions. The figures I cover are worth doing justice, and sometimes giving your own personal opinion doesn't really fit that goal. But for this episode, I'm going to throw objectivity to the wind and discuss my opinions on a topic near and dear to me. Why read about history at all? Usually this question is answered by either witty one-line aphorisms or overwritten poetical forewords for academic books on historical topics. For me, these answers usually tend to be quite underwhelming, yet still overly zealous about the purity of studying such a hallowed subject. While the idea of knowledge for its own sake sounds romantic, the prospect of such a reward only attracts academics, not the vastly more populous general public who want something out of their reading. It's really easy to simply say we ought to be knowledgeable about a topic, Every discipline's disciples promote the idea that their subject must be understood, whether it's economics, sociology, or history. But we live busy lives full of obligations. All too often, those who have the leisure to study do not understand how privileged their position is, and how the average person's life is not exactly conducive to pursuing academic tomes decoding niche knowledge. Though history today might not be the most profitable degree or the most thriving university department, pundits from all sides of the political spectrum agree on the value of the past, or at least investigating it. Whether it's a Republican Party paying lip service to the founding, or a Democrat arguing for the importance of critical race theory being taught at schools, the discipline of history still plays a significant role in public discourse. In polite company, we all affirm the importance of being informed, but in reality, all of us fail to live up to this standard. Thanks to increased accessibility, there is a vast array of knowledge out there. We could spend the rest of their life in a library, reading books at random, and still not have an iota of all human knowledge. For most of us, a rigorous academic debate is a chore and we have more pressing obligations to our families, friends, and careers. That is why I want to give you kind of my version of a sales pitch to the layperson to explore history, from a liberal perspective, of course. In my opinion, history makes one more acutely aware of their freedom. My favourite philosopher Cicero once wrote, To be ignorant of the past is to forever be a child. While this might sound a little bit harsh, there's an element of truth to it. We live in the most prosperous, peaceful, and tolerant age humanity has ever seen. And this might seem quite hard to believe, thanks to the frenetic pace of modern news outlets, but don't be fooled. There is a tendency to view history from the perspective of the so-called greats, the conquerors, the generals, the politicians, basically those in power who made big decisions. But this approach ignores the plight of the other 99.999% of humanity. Strip away all the grandeur of the past and what do you see? For every picturesque description of nostalgic old world morality, there are hundreds of stories of cruelty, barbarity and poverty. For most of history, our forefathers lived in squalor, filth, and possibly ignorance. The famously pessimistic philosopher Thomas Hobbes argued that in a state of nature without government, life would be nasty, brutish, and short. But on the contrary, compared to our conditions today, our ancestors lived in the Hobbesian world, with government. It wasn't just a miserable world, but a static one. For most of recorded history across the globe, economic growth was pitiful. The vast majority of people knew their place in the world, Men would take up the occupation of their fathers, who inherited the same from their grandfathers, and so on. To illustrate my point, take two historical figures, my previously mentioned favourite Roman philosopher Cicero from the 1st century BC, and Thomas Jefferson from the 18th century. Though close to 2,000 years elapsed between the pair's lives, many similarities still remained. If Cicero stepped into a time machine and emerged in Jefferson's Monticello, he would see a world not so dissimilar from his own. Slaves would be working in Jefferson's fields similar to the countryside of Rome, The prime method of rapid transportation for the wealthy was horses and carriages, a technology present in Cicero's time. After chatting with Jefferson, Cicero would then observe Jefferson riding by candlelight. For as much as that changed between the Roman Republic and the American founding, many fundamental facts of life stayed the same. Today, we almost naively assume the world just naturally moves forward, and as time goes by, progress is incrementally made. It might be surprising to find this is a relatively new belief. In the old world of hierarchies and dogma, little changed. Everyone knew their place in the great chain of society. 
Of course, there are examples that contradict this trend, but the broad trend still persists. But imagine now if Cicero and Jefferson stepped into another time machine together to travel to the year 2022. They would be in complete awe of modern technology. Our instantaneous communication, our stores of knowledge larger than any library that ever existed, all at our fingertips, and widespread prosperity that would easily befuddle the greatest minds in history. Our current comfort blinds us to the massive strides we have made. Remember Cicero's slightly harsh wisdom, to be ignorant of the past is to forever be a child. Without knowledge of what came before us, we cannot accurately appraise our current standards. A lack of historical knowledge can manifest itself in the sphere of politics as a lack of imagination. We'll really compare our situation to, we actually become slaves of the present and cannot break our current trends of thought. Economic and political circumstances of course matter, but ideas are just as important. The Cuban revolutionary Jose Marti observed that barricades of ideas are worth more than barricades of stone. A powerful idea, way before the world at the proper time, can stop a squadron of ironclad ships, like the mystical flag of the Last Judgment. Both for better and for worse, ideas shape peoples, cultures, and nations. At its best, an inquiry into the past is an exercise in empathy. We strip away our current way of viewing the world and try to immerse ourselves in the mind of another era. In this process, we critique the past and the present. By seeing the shortcomings of others, we can more accurately assess our own. For example, when studying medieval history, I noticed how few questioned the legitimacy of monarchy, and it was viewed to be the most effective and harmonious form of government, despite all of the evidence to the contrary. At first, I deeply pity the medievals and their ignorance, but eventually I realised that we're actually not that much better. Today, democracy, often regardless of form or efficiency or fairness, is idealised much in the same way monarchy was upheld for centuries. We just don't self-critique very much. We often overlook second president of the United States, John Adams, like in history to a boudoir. This is a kind of octagonal room with full-length mirrors, often found in French aristocrats' homes. He explained that young aristocrats, when they were in poor humour, would retire to their boudoirs. Whatever direction their eyes would turn, they couldn't look away from their ugly, angered expressions. This sight would eventually convince the young aristocrat to suppress their anger after seeing the unsightliness of their features. For Adams, and many others during the founding generation, history functioned as a faithful mirror that allows us to view our best and worst moments. While I'm on the topic of the American Revolution, I'd like to mention that it was an establishment of a new order for the ages, a kind of government unlike any that had ever preceded it. But despite the novelty of their undertaking, the founders constantly reassessed and debated the history of various nations and eras, especially ancient Rome. While Patrick Henry is known for his famous speech where he exclaims, give me liberty or give me death, he also began a speech with a cautious warning, saying, I have but one lamp by which my feet are guided, and that is the lamp of experience. The message was clear. No one could move forward to a new era without understanding what came before their time. Technology moves rapidly while our political culture languishes in the past. The liberal forces on the right wish to return to an idyllic traditionalism that never really existed, while liberal forces on the left insist upon a validity of socialism despite constant failures. Much of our political angst, in my opinion, stems from a lack of knowledge or appreciation of liberalism's place in history. The rights we enjoy today, freedom of speech, religion and assembly, our right to private property and a fair trial and due process, are not the results of impersonal historical forces. They are bequeathed to us thanks to the efforts of people who sternly believe that no one was born with the right to command or control another. We call these people liberals. While academics have done their very, very best to tarnish the reputation of liberalism, it is undeniable that as a political movement, liberals have done more than any other group to secure individual rights. Today, the socialists and communists paint themselves as the heroes of history, but the reality, as authors like George Watson have pointed out in his book The Lost Literature of Socialism, is that the early socialists were deeply reactionary and conservative, unlike their liberal counterparts that looked towards a radical, free world. Take any modern institution part of government, the separation of powers, separation of church and state, the secret ballot, and even the very idea of a constitution. All of these ideas stem from a long line of liberal thinkers. People who question dialogues with political authority and obedience in favour of individual rights, the greatest gift humanity has ever received, seemingly. Today, most governments are republics, but if you ask the average person what a republic is, as I have done a few times, you will be met with a really blank face and an awkward silence. But there was a time when the world was not inhabited by republics, but by absolute monarchs and despots of the worst kind. Republics are a symbol of the secularism and constitutionalism of the Enlightenment. But they are now mere words in popular imagination, and often words divorced from any genuine meaning or sentiment. 
and sadly many words lose their meaning, including the word liberal. Today in America, liberal denotes a supporter of the Democrat Party, meaning true liberals now must use the awkward title of classical liberal, a comparatively stuffy term in my personal opinion. The two world wars coupled with the Great Depression implode support for what we now call classical liberalism, but thanks to figures such as Roswell Delane, Isabel Patterson, appreciation for liberal values kept alive on the most tenuous of life support. Sadly, much of the history of liberal achievement has not been lost, but simply ignored. It's important to stress that what we have today in human history is a rarity. History is a testament to the fact that freedom cannot exist without some form of political power, but political power can definitely exist without freedom. Like the air we breathe, we don't appreciate freedom until we have noticed its absence and are already gasping for air when it's too late. For a liberal-minded person, history is a cautionary tale of freedom's fragility, but it also provides the records of experiments and innovations that have helped best preserve freedom. History can provide both warnings and recommendations in equal measure. If we disown history, we are at its mercy, without a guide or comparison to our undertakings. You might not care about history, but that doesn't change that we are all slaves to the past. Beyond politics, reading about other cultures and nations has imparted on me a personally a sort of optimism. No matter how dire or desperate, there have always been those who break away with the accepted wisdom of their time and question power. When I was younger and a little more naive in college, I was a firm adherent to the idea that individual rights and limits on power were innovations belonging to the Western intellectual tradition. But now that I've read more widely, I can safely say I was very wrong. These are not the heritage of a particular culture, but a universal impulse. One that surfaces from time to time, regardless of cultural norms or widespread persecution. Lastly, something that really has stuck with me is that history teaches us character. One thing I've noticed while doing this podcast is that many of the trailblazers I cover were unpopular and persecuted. They were harassed and insulted by the powers that be of their time and were rarely given peaceful lives. The people I've covered in this podcast tend to share some common traits, a devotion to their conscience, a penchant for self-education, and the ability to turn legal and economic issues into moral crusades. Learning about history has been such a big part of my life. Ever since I was a child, I obsessed over ancient Greece and Rome. Playing the video game Room Total War really cemented my lifelong love of Rome and convinced me at a young age I wanted to be a historian. So thank you so much to everyone who listens. You helped me pursue my childhood dream, which is a privilege and an honor. I hope you've enjoyed hearing my thoughts on the broad, broad topic of why bother reading history, and I promise I won't drag out my opinions all too often. Next time, we'll be back with the usual portraits content. I'll find an underappreciated liberal thinker, talk about how they made the world a better place, but it was nice to have a brief change for once. As always, thanks so much for listening, and I'll see you again next time.